suppose I've always sort of kind of begged for attention and wanted to entertain. You know, like you're sat in a, a prison cell with the whole wind shouting, oh, they should take up the arse, Pete. I love you. Do you? Yeah, come on, man. I felt that. I don't know, maybe I'm just too, maybe I'm just too, I'm too fucked up. Have you heard the Michael Anthony show? So we're all looking for love, and then what if when you find love and you receive love, you know it's genuine, it's still not enough? I'm full of hell. Testing. Hello. But Test. Now, but now it's the cheese and the saucy sun. Do you know what I mean? Move into it or else move the mic off. Really Fatty liver, isn't it? Right. Testing. Hello. Testing. Speak. Eins, zwei, drei. Go on. Speak into the mic. Vier, sieben. Hello. Hello. It is the time for all good men to come to the aid of the party. Go on again. We will move the likes of you off the shores of the United States of America. Yeah. I remember those words. Just make sure to try your best to speak into the mic throughout. Cheers. I said, I said, cheers. Sorry about that. Slightly rid of one anxiety for this one. Right, we're into the mics. Make sure you're speaking into the mic. Yeah? I will, I will. The Michael Anthony Show. Welcome back to all the listeners. And we're honoured to be sitting with Pete Doherty, rock and roll star, poet. What do you view yourself as? Like when you're walking around with the hat on, the iconic neck tattoo, is there an awareness that you're Pete Doherty 24-7 or do you slip into normality and then have to be Pete Doherty dependent? Because gigging, live gigging, a lot of performance to it. Do you know you're Pete Doherty? Are you aware you're Pete Doherty? I or am, I, am I just I saying you're Pete Doherty? I don't Doherty? know so much about, these, um, about the boilerplate thing, but I'll be honest with you, this morning... I, saw, I was sat naked in this amazing up, upholstered chair in a Belfast hotel room, feeling a little bit stranded. And it's funny you mentioned the hat because I thought, right, I'm going out into Belfast, 8 o'clock in the morning. Just try hit it. I know I'm annoying you, but try hit it. All right, I'm going out into Belfast in the morning. Am I going to wear my hat or not? Why would, you know, why would you be... Why would you be overly concerned, even anxious, about something like that? Do you know what I mean? I mean, I was pretty fucked in a way. Not, Not, you know... Not through, like, substances or anything, just generally, you know, thinking, fuck, this is the first date of a 25-day tour, and I can't do this anymore. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, one gig at the limelight fucking wiped me out for two months. But I had to get out there. So I went out into Belfast without my hat. Yeah. It's weird being such an object of culture in the way that, like, you live once, and you're never going to get to be a fan you haven't been a fan since 18, 20. You haven't been able to look at people and be free. Yeah, but... You're the, never going to get a no, time but of... the but tide, the tide shifts so quickly. It's scary, you know? You suddenly you find yourself, you're 44, you know what I mean? And you're walking past the queue to the club that's after the venue played and not one kid in the crowd has got the faintest idea. You are like, who's that fucking foul geezer in a hat? You know what I mean? They shift so quickly. I mean, even at the gig last night, I sat, I, I sort of stood at the... The barrier watching the support acts, you know, and there was a few like, can I have a, you know, a selfie and all that, but generally, do you miss the obsessive fame because there's more pressure when writing a tune because it's going to more ears? I, I don't know really because a lot of those, a lot of the like concerted obsessive effort I put into a lot of the lyrics. Sometimes when I'm singing now, I think, yeah, that that one's a bit lazy actually. You know what I mean? Like a bit libertines, of, uh, mm, yeah, libertines, or or songs that were half mine. That ended up as Libyan tunes, and I think I could have tidied that up more. And then I wonder about people's taste, and then I do wonder about why people tune in. But I think I'll always be that 15, 16-year-old kid who was 
locked into Smith songs, Stone Roses songs. You know, that was my... Rock and roll is all about not playing the game. But why so allergic to any form? Why, why? did you see it out to such a level that it, that it like... People can say self-sabotage, but... Why so allergic to any form? It's a good line, that. Why so allergic to any form? Of conformity to the extent mm, of sacrificing mm. yourself in an era in which kind of the Jesus Christ sacrifice shit was... You weren't in the 60s or 70s. The internet was always going to clean it up and have pseudo-sacrificial lambs rise no, to the top the internet, anyway. The internet doesn't clean up. The internet, like, it... it it, it messes it up. I mean, Playing you see it. the amount of smiles. I mean, even Jim Morrison and Lennon, we know they were tortured, but they're all smiles, you know, when you see their footage in the 60s, you know, that was... Or are you staying in character a bit? You mean, I mean, I always think to myself, anyone who really understands about heroin addiction and references to it in the lyrics, they're not at the gigs. They're not buying the records. They're out there. Yeah. They're lost in their addiction. They ain't got time. You know what I mean? I always believe that. I mean, I'm, you meet recovering addicts, or people on methadone programs at gigs, but you don't meet the addicts at the gigs unless they're in the band and they need the money. You know what I mean? Was it weird to be amongst the kind of addicted heroin crew when you're someone who was functioning and had a kind of a high pressure career? Or does the the mutual? I, think I was kind of propped up a little bit by if we're going to talk about specifically about people that I was using with who weren't, you know, who weren't, you know, who were, you know, shoplifters or, yeah. you know, phone snatchers, or whatever. You know, for a couple of weeks, we could do a gig and then plot up somewhere with the money from that. So, a certain amount of, yeah, emotional usury involved, and it's always quite messy. By who? By by, whoever it is I'm engaged with, whoever whoever it is I'm plotted up with. So, if I'm getting you know a pocket full of notes for a gig, and they're getting me. You know, a high quality connection. Yeah. But we're going back now. I mean, this is this has been a few years. No. No, but it's just a fascinating life as much as anything. And I am a bit like been in the flesh with you, having watched and listened to the music for years. Like, uh, what part of your childhood do you think made you feel the need to bleed emotionally? I think, if we're going to be honest, I think it's from having. Parents who, who, okay, so if they were, they were working class in origin, but they wanted to escape from where they were from. So, like, you know, my dad, he, he joined the army, and my mum was a nurse. She got out of Liverpool, he got out of London. They created this life, and it was all about work. And yet, so as I grew up with this sort of work ethic, and my dad made his way through the ranks, we'd go back to London and Liverpool and see the family, and I was always more, like, drawn to that. Yeah. And and he he sort of romanticised this. I suppose it's kind of romanticising romanticising the the fucking the hideous childhood that he had. I, mean, I hope he's not listening to this, but <clears throat> and I always felt like I, what do you mean by hideous? I, I, just I, I just felt like you know he was like you know he was. Like, I'd say to him when I was eleven, I'd be like, "Oh, Dad, what would happen if the eleven-year-old you met the other me?" And he'd like, "Oh, I'd fucking I'd break your nose and nick your watch and things like that," and I'd be really shocked by that, and. uh I suppose maybe I've never really thought about this, but I thought maybe I needed to. I suppose I wanted. Did you need to prove yourself to be a character that could take something on something like that? Take on that kind of Liverpoolian background, something. and you didn't like being the soft Pete character. No, no, yeah, but that, but I am soft Pete character. Soft emotionally, that's I am the, soft Pete yeah. character, but I was always drawn to to uh, to theatre, you know. And, and poetry and expressing yourself like in in in, in different accents and different voices, you know what I mean. And yet and yet it was never. It was always like a joke to him. Was well, the old man's know, approval nearly an impossible? No, there's no approval because like, you know, the, just because of my emotional makeup, me being a sensitive boy in that in that environment, there was no, there could be no approval. You know what I mean? He he's never like you know. If I had a kid. Who, who 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 did a band and you know what I yeah. mean? I mean, I think he's been to two gigs in my life. But do you, you respect it to an extent, though, because that level of cultural difference? I don't know. I think I've always just begged to be like. Uh, I suppose I've always sort of kind of begged for attention and wanted to entertain. And he's 
he just like got his head down and knuckled down and, 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 and was disciplined and didn't need that from the world. And yet I know deep down somewhere inside him, there is, there is that, like there's that side of him that he, that he can't let out. Like, I think when he was 15, he was like an apprentice, like a uh, fr- picture frame uh, apprentice. And one time we were going to, we were going to see QPR and we stopped off at the, uh, at the, the Guinness Trust flats by QPR. And he said, oh, we'll pop in, we'll see Dave, who used to be the my apprentice. Uh, and he, and then my dad was in the next room and I said to Dave, oh, what was my dad like as a as a kid? And he went, yeah, he used to stand on, he used to stand on the platform at Paddington Station writing poems. And I was like, what? And then when I asked my dad about that, I said, oh. You know, later on, I said, Dave said, and my dad like, he dismissed it and said it was bollocks. So that was a creative part of him killed. Yeah. And therefore he wasn't willing to see you accept the baton and use the genetic talent no he really sat me when I, when I started knocking about with the guitar and got it in my head that I can maybe do this I can maybe write songs and make it go but he, he like 50s he sat me down and said look you got no music talent you can't sing you know what I mean you get your hair cut try and get a job in the city so, and I was like no no dad honestly I'm going to make it go with this and he thought it was he thought it was quite funny. I think he still does I think he still thinks it's quite quite funny like you know i mean i can you know that we all live a life and then eventually like people get married and you you live not just for yourself but for someone else is it an age and appropriation based on your own life or is it a different form of love that made let's say your current wife the person that made you go fuck it i'm giving this everything or is it a case of your own exhaustion that that's leads a big to big switch i'm still like stumbling around for answers yeah no no to questions I, I, about I my dad and uh, we got 50 minutes. Yeah, no, you're talking about my, my wife, Katia. Don't give a shit, none of this Well, I don't know, because no matter how I try to express myself right, regarding her, and I have done interviews, because no, she ha- always pulls me up on it at the but end. But when it goes to normal why people, why did you say that? Normal why people, are you saying that? Normal people have around three girlfriends who do the city job, who don't pursue that creative urge in their body, and aren't in touch with their pain, and they still do drugs, and they still do cocaine, and get high and get pissed weekly, if not daily. And... They never really embrace love or are willing to be vulnerable. They still have 40-year-long marriages. You've yeah. probably had 15, 16 girlfriends because you're such an expressive guy. Probably more, I don't know. But you're an expressive guy, so it draws females yeah. because you're, you're emotionally vulnerable and very in touch with yourself. So how does someone who has that much access to what any man would accept as the one decide that, fuck it, this one's important enough for me to say, fuck it, Pete, stop the neurotic shit? Yeah, neurotic, predatory, erotic. I mean, it doesn't matter how how sensitive and balanced you think you are or understanding you are, there is always that predatory, erotic thing. But then, sometimes you just find someone who you can't take your eyes... Well, no, you find someone who you can't take your eyes off. And then I think maybe Katia had a hunch all along that if I could, you know, stop heroin... To be with her, I mean, it might be a long-term plan. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it happened weirdly. Did lockdown? Just, did just, lockdown? Yeah, lockdown. Played a role and go Com- fuck this. No, no, like, completely, absolutely. It was all like that was the time I, I like, lost like seven phones in like three months. Yeah. I was on probation in La Havre, so I couldn't leave Normandy anyway. And Brexit had happened, and it was all like visa shit. And then you couldn't like you couldn't really leave your home. It was like police on horseback. Everywhere. And what's the point in being Pete Doherty in your bedroom? I'm, I'm all right in my bedroom. It's like, you know, just kick back, watch The Simpsons. It's fun. The amount of life experience you get through when you're so willing to even work through the bad moments and make yourself so exposed to the fishbowl of publicity. But you go through so much life that in comparison to the normal human, the way we've set up this society is privacy. You've six friends. You've a few fucking cousins. Did you just kind of sign off and go... I don't own myself, or do you plan on in your 50s, 60s, and 70s looking back on the legend and no, having a laugh at your grandkids? No, Football at the back, I, I was Pete Doherty once. Yeah, I don't know. Well, there's a lot of Pete Duckies out there. It's a very common name. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but you know what I mean? I, by I, the... I kind of, but the fishbowl thing, I don't really. I mean, for all my. For all my, uh, maybe, you know, narcissism and, and sensitivity, I, I've actually got quite thick skin for things. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when you're sat in. You know, like you're sat in a, a prison cell with the whole wing showing. Oh, 
they should take up the arse, Pete. You just learn to like block these things, block these things out. You know what I mean? I think that heroin was a big part of that as well. I suppose it was like a blanket in a way. Or is there any party that kind of also doesn't give a fuck at the same time? That's that's a grand feeling. That's like that's the that's the place you want to be. You know, you can care, but actually, you don't really give a fuck what people think. But you can't you can't sustain that feeling. Can you can bowl down the street, you know, singing out loud, you know, shouting things at parting, uh, but parting buses, isn't... stroking every dog that you see, and not care at all. But you know, it doesn't always last. You know what I mean? So it's 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 ups and downs. Caring is the biggest waste of human thought there can be, though. We spend so much time on it, on actually giving a shit, living as if um, we aren't dying. How pointless is giving a fuck? And when you look at all, when everyone says all the young musicians who went, Jim Morrison, Kurt Cobain, uh, what it seemed like some of the fucking media hoped was you, Amy Winehouse. Ah, uh, yeah, she's like... Did it just get too much or did she... I mean, have you not heard her songs? Have you not been like, insightful and powerful... Like I'm rude and and touching like her voices. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? And that has to come course, from a level of, of immense cared, pain. But it's not. But it's not a waste to care. It can be a drain. It can be a strain. But it's not a waste. You know what I mean? That's who she was for all. Like you know, like the change she went through so fast. You know what I mean? All of a sudden she's like all tattooed up and like all gangstered up. But she was still that that caring. That caring songstress. You know? Was there a part of you when you were with Amy Winehouse? You were going, she's better than me. With her, with her, actually, yeah. There's that, you know. I think like, she's one of the ones where I think, fuck, you know. Even this morning, actually, at that moment when I was in that the Belfast hotel room, I was flicking through the TV, a little bit of telly shopping and CNN, and then it came like Zoe Ball's breakfast show, whatever, and um, it was a snooker themed playlist, and they played Back to Black. You know, vague snooker connection, but yeah. Were you intimidated by her musically? Did you care what she thought of your shit, even though you you'd been out before? I don't know if I want to like go into that too much. No. Don't know why that is, but I always find it quite difficult. We spent we spent times together, but communication was always a bit of an issue. You know what I mean? Because uh, yeah, they were obliterated. Like when, when you when you have two figures of that talent, would you ever just sit down? Because everyone just thinks whatever. We see a video of mice, two people who have their drug demons. Oh my god! But no, mice, but yeah. yeah. But is there ever a conversation where she's just like use a G instead of an F here? Does it ever just get really basic? We're sixteen again. She's going, you know, I listen to fuck forever, and I recommend an A minor. Or do, does that simplicity ever come into that level of talent in conversation? Yeah, but she was a bit harsh, actually. She was a bit of a harsh critic. Whenever I pick up the guitar and say, you got any melee ideas? She's just like, that shit, things like that. You know what I mean? And I could never tell if she was testing me because I didn't, you know, I didn't think it was shit. I'd end up turning it into a song, you know what I mean? That I was really proud of, but I could never kind of lure her in the way I could lure in other people I've written songs with. What do you think is the greatest piece of music you've composed up to now? Bar the last album, because that's obviously, it's a recent, so there has that positive... What's the best song? Can't Stand Me Now has the kind of commercial thing. It gave the story you and Carl to the public. You, you fell out yeah, on the lyrics. Yeah, it did, it, did, it did do quite well commercially. Gunga Dean. Yeah, Gunga Dean's a tune, yeah. Who wrote that? Bum, 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 me, Wolfman and, and Carl. No one talks about Gunga Dean. No, Good video, true. walking through Thailand. Yeah. I remember watching that in Austin, Texas, and then then you have the backlog of research. Who the fuck is Gunga Dean? And then you have yeah. the concept of Better Man Than I, and then you have... When someone first hears a Libertines tune, the background research, yeah, okay, QPR. So he's a f- diehard football fan, but they're shit. So there's even longing Oy! in that. No, do you know what I mean? Yeah, the, 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 there's uh, even longing in that. Yeah. The whole person. If you were an Arsenal fan, for uh, me, uh, Pete Doherty, it, he isn't Pete Doherty as much. No. Nah. Yeah. It all, well, the keep, entire character of the man, This you can hear it in the songs. Like. Yeah, well, well, QPR started out, the original name was St. Jude's Boys Club. And St. Jude, of course, Ben St. Lost Causes, isn't it? You know. Do you still like football to the same extent? Yeah, no, I love football. I like. I can't, you know, if I'm if I'm walking through a park, I have to stop and watch, even if it's kids kicking around. I love the game. Um, Does it ever get to an extent, though, because you, you're like a fanzine guy, your first bit of creativity was writing fanzines, that first need to express yourself. Was there ever a point at the darkest points of your own life where you thought, ah, it's just tribalism, it's just guys kicking a ball. Did you ever get nihilistic with that much? 
self-sabotage? Did you ever get to... Why did you never get to the point of nothing matters? How do you always saw such beauty and point in life, even though you were living a life that seemed like you were abusing existence, if you know what I mean? I think it's too much in my DNA. It's sort of, you know, I'd go and like, I'd take girls on a first date, we'd get into QPR's ground when it was empty and just sit, sit in the stands or like, you know, sit in the loft when it was terraced and I managed to get in the dressing room once and get some, a pair of shorts. Um, so, yeah, no, it's not tribalism. We can't, it's not nihilism. I mean, it's like anything. It's like, but I'm talking about life nihilism. Yeah, I Have know, you ever gone down that road? Have well, you ever got just proper fuck it, I'm not a fuck Yeah, this. but that's a dangerous road because that's how you become an extremist. That's how you become a, like a, a white supremacist or a religious fanatic when you just think, you know what? Fuck it, I'm willing, I'm willing to die for this. I don't even care what yeah. side I'm on. I'm willing to stand my ground. And was rock and roll not that for you, though? Were you, were you willing to die? Were you willing to be the dead musician guy? Was I thought there... I was. I thought I'd gone. I thought I was dead, to be honest. I thought I'd, I'd strung out so far that there was no way back. I was in such a like, in twisted place for a while. Did you ever physically feel you were dying? Yeah, no, I think I, I was dead for a long time, I think, physically. You know what I mean? And they had to, like... Fucking and yeah, and and things the, on the chest, yeah, all that. Yeah, shit. and the microphone, the electric guitar was a, a, a sort of temporary defibrillator or something. You know, it's a beautiful rock and roll story. It's strange, but, yeah, because that's what I was trying to sing about as well. But then uh, it all sort of caved in on itself because originally we were we were quite a melodic <laughs> melodic sort of bootleg Beatles type group. You yeah, know, eighteen, nineteen, yeah, yeah, yeah. twenty, and then we thought this ain't going anywhere, and slowly it started to get a bit. A bit more twisted, more cranky. You know Flags of the Old Regime? Yeah. You know the lyric, I don't want to die anymore, any more than I did want to die before? Again, the listener's entitled to perception of lyrics, and it could be wrong. It seemed like you nearly had that discussion together about this level of kind of drug abuse and this self-sabotage, and are we flirting with death because we don't want to be here? And you're nearly saying, I don't want to die anymore, but not any more than I wanted to die before. Yeah, is that guitar in tune? Yeah. Is it? Check it here. Yeah. Are you going to do it? Well, I haven't played it for a while. I just wanted to see how it, how it worked because I seem to remember it was... Uh, that would be beautiful. What an honor. Oh, let's have it right. We all know the score. For three nights Stuck behind your door Chewing off your jaw I think, I think it was Wolfman that, that stoned you in And yeah. showed you in yeah. Made your fortune But you, you broke stuck. inside How you gonna stand up there In front of the whole wide world And you don't feel them songs No I think it was Wolfman had the line I don't want to die anymore. And I think I had problems with that line because I'd never said that I, I want to die, even though secretly there's like songs like Death on the Stairs where it says, you know, oh, please kill me. Yeah. Oh, baby, don't kill me. But now I want to do it. I say, someone, please kill me. And then, no, don't kill me. But so he, he, Wolfman's gone. I don't want to die anymore. And then I've had to add. Any more than I did ever want to die yeah, yeah, yeah. before. Because he used to be like, let's go on stage and like, and blow ourselves up on stage and shit. Yeah, like that. how did the, like, well, the Wolfman, could he have been, if he wanted, like if he was arsed, could he have been right at the top of lyricism and songwriting and popular I culture? He, I think he, well, taking away the popular culture, yeah. I think he is the top of lyricism. Why was Carl against the Wolfman thing? Was it just that he was just kind of close-minded and taught junky or was there a little bit of envy? It's a really, you know what? I hate it when they say this on CNN when they ask a politician a question and they say, that's a really good question but that is the question I've been waiting for for years because I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. No one's ever asked that. It's, it's just, you know when you've got two friends yeah. who, you, who, who you, you love both of them, respect both of them, value both of them and you bring them together and something just doesn't, you know, they just can't get on, you know? It was like that from day one. I don't know why, really. I can't say why. Why did, did Wolfman just have no ambition to be 
like monetarily successful and just was really about it's all about creativity and intellect and Carl just was a bit of a mixture so there was a threat like in a way if you never met Carl would you have ever seen rough trade 60,000 people did you need that discipline which could also be viewed as a little bit sell out hurry when we signed to rough trade I wanted to sign to this little label called high society records for a grand because they were going to let us release whatever we wanted when you look at the Carl think, Barat thing, like we relating to that, like we've all had best mates, we've all had fallouts, but when you share a project like that, do you understand his annoyance, or is there still a bit of? Oh, no, but the thing is, what did you expect him to do to make it work? Is what I'm saying. Do you know what I mean? Like his whole thing was, you're too strong out. What do you want him to do? Join? Did you want him to join the strong out in this? Did I want him to join the show? Probably. I mean, but that sounds like a really selfish thing to say, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? And so many people couldn't handle it. And and some people actually just wouldn't enjoy it. No, exactly. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah. heroin, never taken th- it. No, I think a lot of people can't. Is it good? Can't Is it good fun, for heroin? Sake, Do you know what I mean? Is it fun? You're, you're clean now, but just it, everyone associates it with just heroin, no way back. It, it, very negative reputation. Tesco bags and brown teeth. But when you're on heroin, you're not just lying down fucking having seizures. That's the way the movies tell it. Is there a bit of fun on it? Heroin is fun. How am I going to say that? You know you know the public reputation heroin has, and I just think that yeah, I just, the way we overrate just, these just issues, no, I know, it but, adds to the but, stigma and the kind of over-criminalization of it. There's more bodies under know. the yeah, ground I due know, to I the know. way we treat heroin as opposed to if we got yeah, real with it and no. go, is heroin fun? People aren't going to go and do gear, but just let us know what it's like. So the distance between junkies and general public is narrowed, and therefore we can deal so, with so addiction her- her- better. Heroin is a chemical compound, right? They took like, the, the, the they took the opium, right, and they synthesized it, and they mixed it with a few different things. In Germany, this was right in the late nineteenth century, and they called it heroin for a reason. You know what I mean? Because it made these these students that they 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 tested on for the first time, it made them fucking like feel heroic. You know what I mean? And they and the word junkie came from the fact that these students who had they tested this this new synthesized opiate on, um, they sent them all out to gather scrap metal, you know what I mean, mm. to bring in and sell in order to pay for their next fix. It was like it was instant. It was like fucking okay. hell, we've created something fucking, and then you know now you've got like fentanyl, which is fentanyl, fent, f- fentanyl, fentanyl, which is like this super super opiate. Like I mean. But isn't it strange to live a human life trying to get to a non-human form? What's the difference between injecting ketamine and just... Oh, my Lord. A bit of a sniff. I don't think the difference is in like height or depth between sniffing it and injecting it. I think injecting it is... So if you sniff it, maybe you will have that strange distortion that can sometimes lead to like a central point of understanding everything from... Uh, close proximity. So this this lead, for example, yeah, on ketamine. I might if I sniff some ketamine, I might really like understand what's going on with this lead, where okay. I am, what's happening. You inject it, and then you get this rain, like a what's that stick, the Aborigine stick. Yeah. So that goes from your toes all the way up, first of all, and then you're not just like understanding the, the cord. You're gone. You're inside that. You're inside that cord. You've gone down the cord. You're whacked up through there. So you've, you... gone, you've gone across the fucking wheel. You're in Aswad. You're a hippo. And it's not sustainable. You can't carry on like that. You can maybe try it and thank your lucky stars you came out alive. You can't be injecting ketamine. You know what I mean? It's not a sustainable Isn't lifestyle. It's so obvious that the problem with I mean, drugs when is I think the about, fact that we can't the... have these conversations about drugs. If we could have people actually talk about what happens I, as I, opposed I, I to the vilification. I, I, I can't because I tried to study it very carefully. I mean, even though I was like... Seen as quite wanton and gratuitous, I was actually quite a, a kind of a cautious, a cautious explorer in a lot of ways. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a bit like dipping your toe in the water, though injecting ketamine. You Were you semi-cautious with all the drugs? 
and it's overrated because we were famous, how much you dove into it. Like, would you still, if you've had a long session, would you still go, I'm not arsed overdosing. I'm just, sit this one out for a fi- And because you're famous, oh, we think you had no I don't limits. Know. That's like anyone just like some lad on his fucking, uh, on his, you know, like, you know, like the lads in the country go around on the motorbikes, belting off, belting off across the hills. Guinness. Huh? Pass me Guinness. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. At what point do you stop like enjoying just enjoying the uh, the motocross bike across the fields and then not giving a fuck whether or not you actually die going over the next hill or around the next bend? Sex addict. I mean, that's not an addiction. If you see, if you like, if there's an object of your desire, like you know, it's it's not about necessarily having a a sexual relation. It's just like owning that and having it and then moving on you know that's not that's not enjoying the shag is it what about the people who claim I'm a sex addict and that's the reason why I've had affairs and the reason why I I can't hold down a sustainable relationship as opposed to just being A curious and B a narcissist I love sticking my dick in a hole so much I can't stop let's get real that's not an addiction it's a choice and man has always enjoyed shagging animals have always enjoyed shagging go down to the level of saying we're sex addicts, we're just getting fucking stupid and ridiculous. And we've structured a society in a way that we just don't allow survival for people who are just a little bit hedonistic. Like, when you're in those rehabs, there is a so much bullshit, I'd say. I'd say you need it, I'd say, not just contractually, but you, you do need to find yourself again, but I'd say you're sitting around people half the time going, shut the fuck up. And not just in a way of, shut the fuck up, I want to do drugs. Shut the fuck up in terms of, like, Let's get real about humanity. That's not why we all get out of it. That's not why we're on all gear or why we shag too much or drink too much. We're not looking at it properly here. Come on. So I was in rehab with this Australian fella for a bit. I'm not going to say his name. Um, and he was telling some wild stories. We got on quite well, actually. He's a bit of a, an amateur poet. No, he was a poet. But he was telling stories about how he would paid this Cambodian farmer to let him fire a bazooka or a cow. And how his neighbours' wild turkeys had come on his land and he spray-painted them. And then one day we were taken on this day trip to see these elephants. And it was awful. They were all, like, doped up and chained to these bollards. And and everyone came back a bit gloomy. And then we had a session. And the counsellor was like, uh, so what did you think of the trip to the uh, the elephant? Um, and this guy was like, oh, mate, this was like, uh, this is really cruel. You know what I mean? Like... What they're doing those animals, chaining them up, and the council was like, "This is from the guy who fired a bazooka at a cow." And um, I'm happy to tell it the wrong way around. It was quite funny when I thought of it. It's all down to fucking ourselves, really, isn't it? I suppose that it's, yeah, I suppose it depends, not, no, it depends no how quickly can help it depends us. how quickly you're spent, isn't it? I mean, if you've got a desire to. It's a fuck and fuck, and it's not satiated. Like you know, what but I mean? in life in if general, you get, no, but if you get your end away, if you get your end away, and like it's a mutual enjoyment, and you're satisfied, you know, what I mean, then that's one thing. But if immediately after you have to go chasing something else, then that is that's that's a concern. But how many people I mean? in your life have helped you? Are you a sex addict? Wank addict, maybe. Sex wank, calm down. How many people have helped you in life? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like at the end of the day... At the end of the day, it's like... If my, we're all, if my, no if my, one can help us. My, You're the if, one here playing a gig in Dublin tonight and all the people from the past aren't up on the stage in the present playing the fucking tunes. And a lot of this addiction and self-hatred of, of anyone is an obsession with the past and a worry about the future that hasn't come yet and the past is gone. And being present, genuinely being fucking present and in the moment is the answer to a lot of this shit. Hmm... Because all the characters from the past and it makes a great book and it's a great story and it's part of your identity but we still fucking battle on. Seconds are seconds, minutes are fucking minutes and hours are hours. Nothing fucking matters that has happened or will happen. And a lot of this addiction and I'm gonna do it again is because they haven't forgiven or just fucking deleted their past selves. And they've forgotten that life just goes on. And it goes on until you die. And no one cares if you were a smack addict or the president of fucking America. No one gives a shit. You're underground. Like, I'm there, there was a lot in there. I like to think that there are, you know, in the in the melee and confusion, there are some sacred moments where things do matter, where you can connect with people. Some songs that still move you. Soul Shire 99, in when your, you in, the your, in your darkest moment, in your, like, your, your most hopeless 
you know, Hitler was a good guy moment. There must be like some she, obscure what, tune that that will always fucking grab you. Would, you know? would it be outrageous if I uh, grab this in front of you? Oh fuck my hip! I think it would be. I think if I went there, uh, what is it? She opened her heart to tear away the sheepskin tear away scarred and full of heroin <coughs> This is Wolfman again, isn't it? It's about him. It's about him. I wrote it. Opened her heart to tear away a sheepskin tear away was all covered in scars and full of heroin. What well, everyone said from the start, I'm not one single thing could ever be okay. She didn't listen anyway. She opened her heart and threw her cares away At night they held on so tight in the dark She brushed her hair away She ran, she heard him say But all my life I've been fighting To make the best of and with a very bad luck a very bad lot, a bad lot indeed. Well, are you fighting? Got you nowhere. If nowhere's here with you on my skin, you could fight forever. Even if you killed them all, you'd never win. Just give me your surrender. And find some other way to heal the pain Cause that stuff will never mend you It's like trying to dry your eyes in the poor rain She opened her heart to tear away Sheepskin tear away all covered in scars and full of hair oh, and sheep hair sheep sheep skin tear away Is that right? You had Evan Welsh on your uh, podcast, didn't yeah. you? How was that? How'd that go? Have to listen to that. Good man. Good I, man. I was working at Filthy McNasty's in Amwell Street. I was about 18. I served him a Guinness, actually. I was surprised by how tall he was. Was this post train spotting? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Train spotting came out when I was about 15. So I was about, this was, I was about 18. Where'd you get the line for the I subscribe to the Umberto Eco view? That Noel's a poet and leaves a town kind of. For me, that's a perfect combination. Yeah. At least 17 minutes. It's, weird. it's so weird, isn't it? It's so weird. Fucking hell. Did you just come up with that yeah, shit? Yeah, yeah, it's tough, man. Yeah. It's just nonsense. Like. There's no buzz that beats that, is there? Huh? There's no buzz that beats playing your own tune. Does it still feel the same as it did at 18? Just, just banging out your own expression of music yeah except except that back then no one no one was it no one would listen like i wrote albion when i was 17 and i go to open mic nights that's a grab one when you're still playing let's say at 44 all the people there even when you're playing glastonbury do you remember being 16 and no one listening to you 
especially when you're playing the same tune you wrote when no one was listening to you. Thought, what a completion thought, of manhood, though. I, yeah, when I, when what I, trust in your idea. Everyone has ideas at 16, I'm going to do this. But imagine the clarity of having an idea at 16 that has thousands of people when you're 40 singing along to it. You've always stayed in touch with your identity. Drugs or no drugs, you were still true to that fucking kid because there's now that stranger singing what I feel. So you're never really isolated. Gear or no gear, well, well, you're actually, find, you're less isolated find, than any of us, you selfish guns. A bit frustrated that, that this, I thought, fucking I've written this song, it mo- it's moving me. Why is that, you know what I mean? If I play, why is it not? Y- you're fine. You, you've written tunes that people sing along to and you've changed people's lives. You, you've had a really good life. In a way. I think I might, if I can take you one of my therapists or something. This is like really, <laughs> no, but I can't, I can't hear these things. It doesn't make sense because, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm just too, maybe I'm just too, I'm too fucked up. I think like play, it's, it doesn't work like that for me. But it's a fact though. Yeah. It's hard to, it's hard to, can you like, I don't know. Say you're on stage playing a song. And if even if one person is having a chat with a person next you, you to you would him, still feel insecure about that now. Just like too too interested in what they're talking about. I'm, I'm the sort of bloke that will stop the song. I'm not get mardy. I'll just be like, you know. But do I'm you that, view I'm, your but, past but, but, as a but, guy but, who was but, hurting but people was, as opposed to a guy still, who was helping people? No, yeah, always. But if 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 I thought that just playing music for people's pleasure and if that was a, a positive powerful thing i think I'd, I'd become religious overnight no but it's a type of religion isn't it but i can't yeah. do it there's a barrier there's a barrier that can't because for, for so long it was more like an attack on the crowd and now it's a more of a point like oh people actually want to hear the songs the positivity you've brought to people's lives is immense and there's less than 0.01 percent of people who've ever existed who've had that causation of positivity on people's yeah, lives but you've already said nothing matters anyway but no. never had a conversation like this. I mean, I w- this is a conversation I would have longed for when I was using. You know what I mean? I would have delved deep, but I'm reluctant to do it now because it's just that there's a gig coming up and I know that I peaked already today. I love you. Do you? I long for humanity to understand people like you. and No protection, man. There's no protection, isn't it? No protection. Vulnerable is a good word, actually. Strange word. Uh, a French nobleman. I think the rock and roll lifestyle, man, although it's great and it's uh, it, it it supplies you with a um, filling of a void. Come on, man. You're sat here, like, surrounded by amps. No, I know that. But, yeah, no, but even for me. Roll up with but, your sunglasses. Uh, we're all just looking for love. We're in for, a bunker. We're, no, but, but we're all just looking yeah. for love, though, aren't we? I mean, I'm, I'm serious. Okay, so we're all looking for. We're not, there's no cameras here. This we're just embraced. Bit. I'm not fucking around. So we're all looking for love. And then, what if when you find love and you receive love, you know it's genuine, it's still not enough? Have you got any tunes of your own? If you can play me one of your tunes. Yeah. Gasworks. That's about the deterioration of Dublin society. You ready? Jam with me. Sublime beauty's mine, what line? You can take it, I'll leave it. And I can't make a dime for your crimes, it's a genreless dream. She don't remember the day that she told me she loved me Cause days become strange when they're married with similar themes And the knives of the wives who survived with all things considered So sadly confused cause the knives bred history out Spread his out of my An elbow to cry on A heart with no beat You can't feed your soul And the world's got your teeth Oh, oh, oh Oh, oh, oh Oh, oh, oh Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, 
Yeah, and the gas works is gone Cause your mate's cousin's dad needs an office So there's nowhere to go for the moment You put in the song It's all in my pain, my brain My memories and future Taste of the victim hood capsule ignites safety nets. Let's go a bit quiet here. And I don't have a clue who I am. Half the time, did you know that? And is a love song for you, for me, for him, or for them? Here we go. An elbow to cry on, a heart with no beat. You can't feed your soul when the world's got your teeth. Oh, whoa. Whoa. Hey. Never no? performed that for anyone. Just no? Pete Doherty, no. But would you respect that? Yeah, come on, man. I felt that. Did you, did you rate it? No. I think so, yeah. I Too simplistic, I, 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 doing an accent. What did you say? The, Too your nervous. Your accent was like double thick for the yeah, song. But, yeah, yeah. But, but you're right, you're Irish, you can do that, isn't it? Mm. What would you make of the... What was, that line? what was that line? I don't. I like the line about I never know who I am. Was yeah, that? I don't have a clue who I am. Half the time, did you know that? Did you know that? Yeah. Is a love song for me, for him, yeah, for or for her, you, yeah. or for them? Yeah, An elbow to cry on, a heart with no beat. You can't feed your soul when the world's got your teeth. Yeah, you know it's feeling. Really um, Joy's going to be dragging you out of her soon because there's a gig to play, which I look forward to watching. But can you give me one more acoustic? Uh, what became of the likely lads? Because I want to, uh, I want to dedicate it to somebody, uh, and this goes out to Pat Martin. Yeah, Patty. Yeah. What became the likely lads? Please don't get me wrong. See, I forgive you in a song we'll call the likely lads. But if it's left to you, I know exactly what you do with all the dreams we had. Blood Wrong. runs thicker. With the Steve, she know if it's important to you. Well, it's important to me. Well, I try to make you see, but, but you, you don't, don't want to know. Know what became of the likely lad? And what became of those dreams we had? Came up forever, though we'll never know. Well, if you pipe or some along, then get forgiven in a song that's quite to touch my lad. They sold the rights to all the wrongs, and they needed some new songs. Say, Welcome back outside. But blood runs thicker, oh, with thicker Steve, she know if that's important to you. Well, it's important to me, and I try to make you see, but you don't want to know, you don't want to know. Oh, what became of the likely lads? And what became of those dreams we had? What became of forever, though? What became of forever, though? I will never know. Don't get me wrong, I'll forgive you in a song we'll call The Likely Lads. Pete, uh, I appreciate you coming on, I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, let's get myself all worked up then, let's see. 
What became <laughs> of forever though? Never know. I sit here all night, but you have a gig to play. Pete Doherty, thanks for coming on the Michael Anthony Show. Stately plump buck mulligan. Uh, show stood some, in the stairwell. Show some uh, respect Martello to the, the Michael Anthony Show listeners while you're here, although it's... Uh, yeah, here we are, the Michael Anthony Show yeah. in the bunker, man, in Dublin. Love yeah. having you. Yeah. Uh, icon. Return Love you, Pete. And my show. It's too. been how many years, my oh, boy. Audio book started. Shard and You still books. don't know my chairs of joy. No need to go, just take Radio it cast. slow. Podcast. And have you heard the Michael Anthony show? Makes me feel just fine. What's it? Makes me see the light. What about those tears? Tears, believe my eyes. How's it make a feel? Makes me feel alright. 